how is the culture change um, impacting the performance culture at AT and T? So I think that you, it, there's been a bit of a shift around there as well, hasn't there? Yeah. So let me start by kind of setting the stage for how we took the model that I just mentioned and articulated it to employees. And um, because for us to get crisp around that was really important to us. We took the 16 behaviors that we identified through that exercise um, and the data that you just mentioned, and we broke those down to four pillars. Serve customers first, move faster, act boldly, and win is one. So, you know, to be straightforward, serve customers first means we don't put internal constituents in front of the customer. We put their needs first. We serve them first in everything that we do. Moving faster, that was really about stepping up to speed up, you know, owning our decisions, and accelerating our action and being bold, being willing to take risks, um, smart risks to move the business forward. And then finally for win is one, it was important to us to address internal competition and that it was important that we succeed holistically as a team, not as separating business units or individuals. So step one, we, we put that forward and we put the 16 behaviors forward, which included things like customer centricity, empathy, empowerment, really important to our discussion today, candor and challenging, and yes. that employees knew exactly what was expected. And then we took our HR practices and married it up to this. Where were we supporting these behaviors and our practices? And where did we have an opportunity to reinforce, embed, and enable in our practices? And one of the practices that we identified that we needed to update was performance development. And so historically, like many companies, we've been evaluating what's the right performance development model. And there are tons out there, all the way from like abandon the performance development model and no longer do annual reviews. And in the name of simplicity, about three or four years ago, that's exactly what we did. We started to remove elements of performance development with the intention that we simplify it. Yeah. And I think our lesson learned is moving from expected behavior to recommended behavior didn't lead to the results we hoped and that it didn't simplify it for employees. They burned a lot of calories trying to figure out, well, what's expected of me? And how am I doing? And what's going on? And so we might've simplified it for our supervisors, but we didn't simplify it for the employee base at large. So part of it was recognizing we got it wrong and that we needed to go back and instill some rigor in the process. Uh, particularly in our world, we know what gets measured gets managed, right? Yeah. So if you're not measuring performance development, you know, unless you've got a really robust, deeply steeped culture of candor and feedback, you're likely missing the mark. So we went back and reset expectations for what development looks like. And in our world, that included, we set explicit expectations on how frequently supervisors should be meeting with their employees and having coaching and development conversations. And we set that as a minimum of monthly. Um, which we think is a bar that we can raise over time. We also set clear expectations about career development and how often those conversations should be occurring. And we said that needs to happen at a minimum on an annual basis. And we shifted our rating process to capture two ratings. Um, and this is some of, you know, a little bit of going back to the future because historically prior to what we thought was simplification, we had this to measure both the what and the how, right? Results and behaviors. Yeah. And historically though, we had blended those to arrive at an overall rating to inform things like talent review and compensation. We think that with that, we diluted a lot of the how, right? Because if two of those things tied, the tie always went to results instead of behaviors. Um, and in an environment, you can recognize some pretty talented tyrants, right? If that's what you choose to do. So. We can now keep two separate ratings, one for results, one for behaviors, both individually inform compensation and talent development practices. And then really key to change in, in our culture was around feedback. And we implemented expectations around both peer feedback and supervisor feedback. So no less um, than twice a year, employees are expected to reach out to at least five colleagues and get feedback. And then that feedback is shared both with the peer and with the, the next level leader to inform development conversations. And so we have a more holistic view of how we're developing employees. And if we're meeting these commitments around conversations and development, 
Uh, we also have a supervisor feedback session. Those occur twice a year where all direct reports are invited to provide feedback about their supervisor's effectiveness and guided through prompts, and that's how we're inspecting if this behavior is happening. In this series, we will be speaking to a range of senior leaders who are pushing a data-driven and digital HR agenda. Make sure that you subscribe via your podcast app of choice and also via our YouTube channel for free and regular interviews with the digital HR leaders of the future.